In this video, we will look a bit more at wave functions and also introduce a derivation, a kind of derivation of the Schrodinger equation, at least motivating it to see where it comes from. And then we'll look at example solutions of the wave function for the hydrogen atom. So remember then that Louis de Broglie uh, proposed wave particle duality, saying that just as photons behave like particles and waves, so also the same could be true for electrons, and that was experimentally verified later on after his PhD thesis back in 1924. The, the experimental results came through a few years later. So this was his hypothesis that the wavelength of a particle is given by the Planck's constant divided by the momentum of that particle. So let's see how that helps us with Bohr's model of the atom. Remember that quantization of angular momentum that Bohr Niels Bohr had used. So here we're imagining, therefore, uh, the nucleus, uh, the proton of a hydrogen atom, and this is an orbiting electron. So we're going to consider different energies of that orbiting electron. Now here we're just crudely uh, representing them at the same radius, but we know that, of course, there are discrete radii with the Bohr model of the atom. And what we're going to do is see that we could represent that electron as a wave function in a particular orbit of the nucleus. So that's why we're showing it at different uh, frequencies for this uh, wave function uh, in orbit around that nucleus. And so we're going to say, therefore, that there are a particular number of wavelengths lambda for that electron within that perimeter that defines the circumference of the orbit of the circle. So we're seeing here that this is 2 pi times the radius of the orbit. And remember, with the Bohr model, those are discrete radii for the orbits. And so we've got a discrete radius Rn. And so 2 pi Rn is that circumference. We're going to say that that is equal to an integer number of wavelengths of the electron. So if we do that, let's see where that takes us. So what's the wavelength of an electron? We know by de Broglie's uh, equation here that the wavelength is just simply Planck's constant divided by the momentum. So we can work with that and combine it with 2 pi r is equal to n lambda. So rn is equal to n times lambda divided by 2 pi. So there's the division by 2 pi. And then we've just taken lambda from de Broglie's relationship where it's just h divided by the momentum and the momentum is mass times the discrete velocity value that is used with the Bohr model of the atom. And so we can see immediately that from that we get exactly the quantization of angular momentum that Bohr had postulated. So this uh, fits beautifully with de Broglie's wave particle duality, and in particular his proposal of the wavelength of the electron, or indeed any particle, being given by this expression of h over p. So as mentioned then, this motivates um, and previously, if you like, it justifies the quantization that Bohr had put forward. So taking things further then, we now have the work of Schrodinger, who received a Nobel Prize in 1933. He proposed a wave equation for this wave particle duality, for these matter waves that we seem to be dealing with, with, with electrons, which are particles and waves. So can we now have an equation that describes what these particles do? And that is what Schrodinger did. And amazingly, his equation, when solved, directly explains why there is quantization, why we have quantum numbers associated with, for example, the hydrogen atom. Because in fact, we need to go way beyond the simple n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on, energy levels of the Bohr model. There are, in fact, many more quantum numbers that we'll be looking at. And the Schrodinger equation points us directly to those, even if it's only from a theoretical point of view, but then it's justified experimentally. So it's a really incredible achievement, this equation that we'll be uh, getting into shortly. So let's start then with uh, modeling a particle, such as the electron, as a wave function. So we're going to use this simple description of a wave function, just a cosine function of a particular frequency k, and we'll see now what that frequency k means. So this is a frequency in space, and that's why we call it a spatial frequency, 
more particular, we can call it the angular wave number. And we're going to define that frequency, k, as 2 pi divided by lambda, because what it's doing is saying how many wavelengths fit into 2 pi. So I'm going to try and show you a graphical example of that. So we're saying k is equal to 2 pi divided by lambda. So just as a simple starting point, if lambda were to be length uh, 2 pi, then k is equal to 1. Okay. Whereas in general, we're saying that k times lambda fits into 2 pi. So that means if k is equal to 2, that means we get two wavelengths fitting within 2 pi. So again, let's look at this uh, wave function in terms of an electron orbit around the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. And now let's get to the point where again, we're going to consider a number of wavelengths for the electron. And we're going to say that this many k, this many wavelengths k fit in an interval 2 pi. And so that's how we can understand k as being a spatial frequency. The larger k is, the more of these waveforms will fit within that uh, interval of 2 pi. So therefore, it can be very readily understood as a frequency. And effectively then, it kind of compresses that function. It means we get far more oscillations per unit interval. Okay, so now let's link a spatial frequency with de Broglie's equation. So Louis de Broglie put forward this lambda is equal to h over p, or alternatively, p equals h over lambda. Then what we're doing here is just simply dividing Planck's constant by 2 pi, and at the same time multiplying the numerator here by 2 pi. So this is just multiplying by 1. It doesn't change the expression. But in so doing, we can recognize now that we have our 2 pi over lambda that we just looked at with our cosine wave function on the previous slide. And then also we have this quantity h over 2 pi, which is known as the reduced Planck's constant, and it appears a lot in quantum mechanics. And so it's called h bar or h cross. And so we're going to define h bar or h cross, the reduced Planck's constant, as h divided by 2 pi. And so now we see this beautiful connection between a particle's momentum and its spatial frequency or the angular wave number. So P is equal to H cross K is a direct consequence of Louis de Broglie's uh, equation here. Lambda is equal to H over P. Right, so let's get back to our simple wave function again. So this could be like an electron, and we're saying it's modeled by a cosine function of spatial frequency k, which we've now understood, and also an amplitude a, for example. Now, if we differentiate that, then we know the differential of a cosine function just goes to a negative sine function, and then by the chain rule of differentiation, we've got to multiply by the derivative of the argument of the cosine. And so here, that's kx. The derivative of that with respect to x is just k. So we get minus ak sine kx. Let's take the second derivative. So now the derivative of sine is just simply cosine. And again, by the chain rule, we've got to multiply by the derivative of the argument of the sine function. And so that's just multiplying by k again. So we get minus a k squared cosine kx. And so that means we've got this following expression here. The second derivative of this cosine function is given by the cosine function simply multiplied by minus k squared, where k, again, is that spatial frequency. So note then that this expression is going to hold for cosine functions and also sine functions. We could work for exactly the same thing by starting with a sine and we'd end up with a sine function. But in more general terms, it also works for a complex exponential, where, of course, e to the i kx is just cos kx plus i sine kx. And so it works through even more naturally here, just showing the derivation. So it's, again, exponential stays unchanged by a, a der derivative with respect to x, and we just multiply it by the argument of the complex exponential. And so that's just simply um, i k. And then we can take a second derivative. And again, it's just the exponential stays unchanged. And so we just uh, keep that and then multiply it by the derivative of the argument, which again is just going to be multiplying by i k. i squared is minus 1, and so we get minus a k squared. And so again, this equation holds for both a cosine, an exponential, complex exponential, as well as a sine function. So we see this as quite a nice general uh, equation that fulfills, um, that, that is rather solved 
um, that has solutions given by cosine, sines, and complex exponentials. Okay, now let's get on to moving into the Schrodinger equation, you know, for those matter waves. What we're going to do is start out in the same way that we did for the Bohr model of the atom. Remember, we had total energy is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy. So we're going to do exactly the same again. Total energy, E, is kinetic energy plus potential energy for a particle. Now, if we define the kinetic energy, we know it's half mv squared. That's just from classical physics. And so what I've done here is write half mv squared. I've squared up the m here, so I've got to divide again just to make sure this is half mv squared. The reason for doing that was getting an m squared v squared, where we know that mv is momentum, so I can simply write p squared over 2m. Now, using Louis de Broglie's formula that we found earlier when we related it to the spatial frequency, we know that the momentum p is equal to h cross or h bar times the spatial frequency. So now we get this expression for the kinetic energy. K, the kinetic energy, is equal to h cross squared, k squared over 2m, where k, again, is that spatial frequency. Right, so now we can go back to our original expression, and we can find that um, energy minus the potential energy, so the total energy minus the potential energy, and then multiplied by 2m over h bar or h cross squared, is simply equal to k squared. So that's a very simple manipulation of a total energy equation at the top of the slide there. Right, again, let's get back to that wave equation for our particle or for our electron. We know already from earlier slides that the second derivative is given by minus k squared psi of x, where psi of x is the wave function. So substituting for k squared from the previous slide, we find that the second derivative of the wave function is just minus times en total energy minus potential energy multiplied by 2m over h bar or h cross squared multiplied by the wave function. Okay, and note also that this, again, remember this equation uh, also works with the complex exponential. So let's develop this a bit further. All I've done here is just multiply this side by minus and then brought h cross squared up to the top here, 2m down to the bottom. And so that's a very trivial manipulation of that expression. And now already we have a, a kind of, not a perfect way of getting it, but a way of seeing where the Schrodinger equation comes from. So we've just got this term here, which can be regarded as um, the kinetic energy. And then we've got the potential energy here and then the total energy on the right hand side there. And so you can recognize this is like a p squared over 2m, the kinetic energy. The u, of course, is the potential energy, and the e is the total energy. OK, and so this is known as the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Notice it's in 1D. We haven't got it as a time-dependent version. That's not what I'm covering in this uh, video. And so we don't, we, we've used full derivatives because it's only a function of one spatial corner x. And so this is just a reminder of kinetic energy, potential energy, and then the total energy with no time dependence. So let's see now where this equation can get us. What we can do is solve for psi, for example, for the case of a hydrogen atom. I won't go into the derivation, but I'll show you the results of solving this remarkable equation, which I hope you can see is actually quite a straightforward equation. But let's see what we get when we look at the electron in a hydrogen atom. So here we go then, the Schrodinger equation being used to find orbitals, or rather the wave function for an electron at different uh, energy levels within a hydrogen atom. So we know from the Bohr model already, remember Niels Bohr in 1913 had put forward the energy quantum number n, and so we have n equals 1, 2, 3, and 4, and so on. And here, if we solve with the Schrodinger equation, we find that same discretization automatically comes through as a consequence of needing to solve that wave equation. And so Schrodinger's equation doesn't have this anymore as something ad hoc, but it's necessary in order to solve the equation. And so here I'm showing wave functions that arise, in other words, psi of x, that arise when we solve the Schrodinger equation. And so this is for the four different energy levels. In fact, there, of course, there are infinitely many. This is just the first four for an electron 
orbiting the proton, which is the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. Now, Sommerfeld, in 1915, so this was before uh, Schrodinger's equation, stated that at each energy level, there should also be different um, orbital shapes. In other words, we had these energy levels from Niels Bohr, but Sommerfeld extended Bohr's model. In fact, that was to account for some uh, spectral lines that were being observed from hydrogen that couldn't be explained, and so he needed to propose an extra quantum number for each of these energy levels. And he added what's called the angular momentum quantum number. And what that does is define uh, a number of shapes for each energy level. So for energy level one, we have one shape. For energy level two, this Sommerfeld extension tells us that we should have two shapes. And indeed, by the way, that's exactly what the Schrodinger equation delivers when we solve it. Then if you go to energy level n equals 3, Sommerfeld had said you need to have three different shapes, three different, um, different alternatives for that energy level. And the Schrodinger equation delivers exactly that. It gives three different shapes, three different wave functions for energy level n equals to 3. And then when we go to 4, again, we get four different uh, shapes. So it's an easy way of remembering this. Whatever the energy level so if it's n equals 3, then you know you should have three different shapes as a consequence of the angular momentum quantum number, or indeed energy level n equals 4. Energy level n equals 4 means four different shapes, and so that's why we see four different shapes. And we label those as L equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And these have been associated, again, with line spectra, and so the old notation is S for sharp, P for principal, D for diffuse, and F for fine which were related to observations of the emission of light from hydrogen or indeed other atoms. Now, Sommerfeld had to extend this model even further. So Sommerfeld wasn't proposing these shapes, he was proposing these quantum numbers in order to explain line spectra. So in 1915, it was the adding on of the angular momentum quantum number, and in 1920, there was a further magnetic quantum number which was to do with the orientation, as it was called. But this is uh, perfectly explained and matches. So remember, Sommerfeld and Bohr were motivated, if you like, by experimental fact here. But uh, these shapes actually come out automatically with these numbers directly from solving the Schrodinger equation. Anyway, Sommerfeld had proposed this uh, magnetic quantum number in 1920, and that meant that so, for example, at energy level n equals 4, um, there are also additional um, orientations for each of these shapes. So, energy level n equals 4, and uh, we'll take a look at that in another video, you can see that there'll be different orientations for, um, for these different orbitals. So, for example, um, this one here, there'd be a number of different orbitals. If that's L equals 3, then you'd go from um, minus 3 all the way up to plus three for the magnetic quantum number. So again, to emphasize, it's amazing that the Schrodinger equation gives the right number of electron orbitals for each energy level, which corresponds directly with experimental observation, which had necessitated, if you like, the seeming ad hoc proposals of all of these quantum numbers that Bohr and Sommerfeld had put forward. Whereas the Schrodinger equation, as we've seen it, delivers those as necessities in order to solve the equation. So I hope that's uh, interested you already in getting to know the Schrodinger equation even better. Thanks for listening.